Hello, welcome to the Melter Podcast. I'm Mike Clarkson. I'm joined today by Tetiana Romanovska. Um, I met her for the first time uh, last month when I was here to interview uh, Eli Hazim, as uh, I hope you have all uh, seen or heard. Um, I, I saw um, when I was here that, um, that um, Tetiana has a lot of very interesting things to say about teaching, about teaching methodologies, uh, both um, in Germany, here in Munich, and also in her native Ukraine. And also I want to talk to her about her journey across, because obviously she is, like Ellie, a, a refugee who's been in Munich now for a few years. Welcome to the podcast, Tetiana. Thank you very much, Moik. It's cool that you're here. Great, Tetiana. So let's make a start with um, your journey across. Because again, um, a couple of weeks ago, Ellie's, uh, Ellie told us a little bit about the journey across. Um, s s start with that. Yeah, so um, as you all know, the war started the 24th of February 2022. And um, as all Ukrainians, um, <laughs> I never believed it would happen. Although it appeared in the media that um, the war is inevit inevitable, but um, all people believed that um, it wouldn't happen and so on. That's why uh, when the war started, it was really unexpected for us and we were shocked for the first week. But um, then um, in just um, one day, we decided that uh, we had to move somewhere because uh, we were scared to remain, to stay where we, where we were. And um, uh, my classmate, uh, who um, at that moment was a volunteer, now he's a representative of the political party, um, he wrote on Facebook that uh, Ukrainians who want to find um, temporal shelter in, in the European Union, they can contact him and he would help them. Um, and this decision was taken in just one minute. Um, we had to pack our things in just half an hour. And when I was packing my suitcase, I asked Ellie, um, which clothes should I, should I take? How long are we going for? Uh, are we going for a month, uh, two months, um, half a year? Shall I take some summer stuff? Shall I take only spring clothes? And Ellie said, I have absolutely no idea. So this was probably the craziest experience in my life um, because you have to pack all of your life um, in just half an hour or an hour because we had to uh, catch the evacuation train. So how much uh, did you have to leave behind then? Um, everything, mm. all of my life. Um, I took some things with me, but um, I was sure, honestly, I was sure that I would return after a month or so. This is in Odessa, right? In Odessa, right. Um, and how heavily um, affected was it? Was there bombing? Um, what was the situation? Odessa has been affected heavily after that time and uh, is still. Um, of course, it can't be compared with some other cities that are closer to Russian borders, like Kharkiv or Sumy or um, the occupied territories um, that have been completely destroyed. But um, I can say that Odessa um, has been affected badly and uh, there are plenty of uh, casualties and um, many destroyed buildings. Of course, once again, um, in comparison with Kharkiv, um, Odessa is, is still in uh, quite good shape, but of course, um, there are uh, air raid sirens every night and um, anti-air luckily hits most of the uh, missiles and drones, but still, um, you never know. So one day uh, they hit all, all of the missiles, another day um, one of the drones uh, destroyed a building and people died. Um, it's like living um, on a mine, you never know. Um, one day you're alive, another day yeah. something happens and you're affected, your death. So have you any idea how badly damaged the, the city is? I mean, could, would it be possible to go back anytime soon if, if the war ended? When the war ends, uh, of course, it's possible to go to Odessa and to other cities. Um, all cities of Ukraine can be rebuilt and this is what Ukrainians will do after the war is over. And uh, of course, um, the most impo important resource is always people. Uh, buildings can be rebuilt um, and everything can be uh, repaired. 
For example, Munich was, uh, people told me that um, it was 80% destroyed during the Second World War. So we can see that Munich is beautiful now and uh, it's one of the most beautiful cities in, in Germany. So, of course, it, it will probably take some years, but everything can be rebuilt. Tell me something about the journey across. You said you only had like half an hour to pack your stuff. How, uh, how, how did that uh, Yeah, work out? so... Um, as I told you before, the decision was quite spontaneous. Um, my classmate posted on Facebook um, about a uh, temporal um, shelter. And I told my husband it was about 1 or 2 p.m. Uh, we were both uh, laying down on the sofa. And we were, honestly, those days we were shocked. The only things we could do is watch the news and pray that negotiations would, would bring some some result, but uh, then we lost the hope very fast. Um, so um, we contacted my classmate and he said, it's better that we leave today, that day, because uh, he said, the sooner, the sooner the better. Nobody knew what would happen tomorrow. And um, there were some uh, military Russian ships on the horizon. At that moment, um, all, all people in Odessa were shocked and expecting the worst. And those first weeks, it's exactly when the most people from Odessa left because um, Putin, when he spoke about um, Ru Ukraine and Russia, he always mentions that he wants to occupy uh, Odessa. Mm -hmm. Practically in every speech he speaks about Odessa, he says Odessa is a Russian city, which is not true. Odessa is a Ukrainian city. And uh, he always says that uh, he would gladly have Odessa. Um, that's why, um, of course, people of Odessa are scared. But once again, um, and I want to uh, repeat it as many times as I can, uh, Odessa has been, will be, and is Ukrainian city. Um, it's not a Russian city. It has never been a Russian city. When did you learn that you would be coming to Munich? <laughs> so my, my classmate, Mikhailo, uh, he contacted me. And um, the same day when we took the evacuation train, he contacted me and he said that uh, he had several friends in the European Union, uh, some of them in Poland, some of them in Germany, and he asked me which country we would prefer. We said that um, it could be any country that would take us for those few months because we expected to stay for a few months. Mm -hmm. And um, then um, we were already in Slovakia, we crossed the border with our suitcases. And then a man called me, uh, he said, hi, my name is Felix and um, I'm from from uh, Munich and you, you're coming to Munich. And I even had to Google because I was like, Munich is where? <laughs> where is Munich? But then I realized it was in the south of Germany. So um, it's something that you don't expect. Like people say you go to Munich and you say, OK, I'm going to Munich. It's nothing that we chose. But honestly, I'm happy that I'm here because I really love the place, the people. And um, now I always hear people, people saying that Munich is one of the best cities in, in Germany. I haven't been to many cities, but I believe this is true. So you're now settled in. Um, you're teaching, uh, you're working. How does it feel? Do you, how much do you miss your, your, your homeland? Of course I miss my homeland. Of course I miss Odessa. And of course I miss my, um, my students, my job in, in Ukraine. Um, in Ukraine, I worked in the university. I taught Spanish in the university. I also worked in an online company. I taught English there. Um, and I previously also uh, had worked in some other companies. Um, I, um, when I came here, I was completely lost. First of all, we, as I mentioned previously, we didn't know how long we would stay. That's why um, it wasn't um, relevant for us. Um, looking for the job wasn't relevant for us. We didn't know if, if we're staying for two months or a month, why to look for a job. Uh, but then um, I started studying German in Volkshochschule and it was a class for the refugees, uh, for Ukrainian refugees. And our teachers were really great. One of them as asked me if I can teach English and Spanish. Why don't I try? And the next day she brought me a card of, of uh, the representative of the English department, Tina. And um, Ellie contacted her. Uh, it was 
I think middle of April 2022. At that moment, I, I didn't, once again, I didn't know for how long we we're staying. Uh, I was sure that the war would end by summer or by the middle of the summer, by, by autumn. But um, I was in a bad emotional state. Um, I was really depressed. And at that moment, I knew that teaching would help me a lot. It would distract me. It would take the bad thoughts away. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that I started working because my first lesson was in the beginning of May 2022. Mm -hmm. So two months after we arrived to Munich and my first lesson was Spanish. I remember it very well um, and I never regretted that I started working so fast after coming here because uh, work uh, really helped me and my communication with the colleagues, uh, being in the um, field where I used to be and that I love being in this teaching atmosphere, talking to my colleagues, attending workshops, it was all great. Uh, it reminded me of the life I had before. Uh, of course, I can't say that I was um, less depressed. I was still depressed uh, because of the war and because of um, the situation in Ukraine. But it really helped me, really helped me. So you've mentioned um, your, your teaching. Um, tell us something about the teaching that you did um, in the Ukraine before you came mm -hmm. in. Here. Yeah, so I worked in university for six years. I taught Spanish there. Um, <laughs> it was um, that there were different courses. I had um, Spanish for um, complete beginners, uh, intermediate level. Um, it was the um, faculty of uh, Romance and Germanic uh, philology, and uh, we taught language to the future philologists. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the same way as um, we teach language to people who want to learn it for traveling or who want to learn the language for everyday life. Um, we used to teach theoretical grammar, uh, theoretical phonetics, so theory of phonetics. Um, I taught grammar, uh, so my lessons were based on the grammar and it was also the translation method um, to help the students understand grammar really well, not only the basics, because uh, they had to be the future philologists, they had to understand grammar better. I also had um, a conversation class and a home reading class, so they, we used to discuss the book they, they read at home. Um, we taught Spanish as first foreign language, second foreign language, and um, the third foreign language. So I had all kinds of lessons and I enjoyed working at the university. Um, of course, um, working in the university also um, was dealing with plenty of papers um, and um, you know some problems when you work in a governmental place you have to um, write plenty of things the programs for the courses but it was fine because i really enjoyed working with the students and of course the most important um, the colleagues were always great to me and uh, i really miss them a lot even now um, I remember in my interview with Ellie last month that uh, he, he touched upon the fact that um, there are a lot of differences between teaching in, in Germany, yes. Munich and, yes. and in the Ukraine. Yes. Do, you want to, do you want to go into a bit more detail? Then? Um, of course, I can't compare teaching languages in the university as I, I have no experience of working in the universities here. But um, what I see in the courses um, in Volkshochschule, for example, uh, first of all, the age of the students. Um, in Ukraine, uh, most people who study languages are young, uh, let's say up to 40, maybe more than 40, but uh, most of them are young learners, um, teenagers, young adults, adults. Um, here in Germany, what shocked me um, that was that um, I had plenty of retired students, 70 plus, uh, which is not... Um, I'm trying to find a word. Which is not, which is not customary, um, not normal. Yes, in the Ukraine, exactly, right? exactly. Um, when I uh, shared with my my friends, my colleagues, that one of my students is 83. Of course, no names, just the age. I said one of my students is 83. In Ukraine, you can practically never see a student of this age. Why is that, uh, Tatiana? Um, I think it's a different mentality. First of all. Um, 
it's difficult to say why um but in ukraine it's more young people who are more interested um in the languages rather than old. of course in germany as you know there are lots of students who um, get to learn english um at work mm -hmm. uh, the companies pay yeah. for english courses those students that you taught at the Volkshochschule, um, the, the over 70s, the over 80s, was that English, Spanish or both? Both. Okay. I had okay. different. So these lessons. are people who, they, they have the, the, the free time? Yes, they have lots of free time and um, they study language for traveling mostly. Um, and I really like working with those people because um, they always share something from their experience. And um, for me, I can say that this experience is really interesting of teaching retired people, older people. Um, as I said before, in Ukraine, I, I had experience of teaching young adults. Um, I didn't really like working with the kids because it's not my cup of tea. So I worked with the teenagers and um, young adults. Um, but I also worked in an online company that provided corporate lessons. So I also taught some companies, um, IT companies. It was business English and English for IT. It was also an interesting experience for me as um, I met great people and they were really enthusiastic about learning the language. So um, I enjoyed that experience too. You, you touched upon the fact that there are differences between um, the, the, the teaching and the methodologies yes. here in, in Germany yes. compared to Ukraine. I mean, on the one hand, you were uh, teaching in a university, which is obviously a very mm -hmm. different environment to like the Volkhochschule. Uh, but do you want to go into some of the differences that, as you see them? Yeah, first of all, I notice that language learning here is more relaxed. I don't know why, maybe because most people, um, okay, not most people, but let's say plenty of people learn language to travel. So uh, there are plenty of courses that are only once a week and it's just 90 minutes. So people come there and they know that um, they will study the language for two years before they can reach A2 level, completely finish A2 level. Or when they start B1, it will be the third year of learning. So uh, they are aware of that um, and it's okay because um, they study slowly, they need language for traveling and it's fine for them. Um, in Ukraine, it's never uh, less than twice or three times a week. Um, I worked previously in different language schools, private language schools, and it was always minimum twice a week and minimum 90 minutes. So um, maybe because uh, people in Ukraine learn uh, language, first of all, to, uh, to, for their work. So not only for traveling but some of them for immigrating and um, some of them for work and that's why they need the language faster mm -hmm. so traveling is great but you can take your time learning the language and is, is it mainly english or is it a lot of other languages english and too? spanish i had plenty of students with spanish spanish is popular in ukraine is there a reason for that um spanish is popular everywhere <laughs> there are no reasons for that um, one thing that surprised me very much when I came here, and um, first it surprised me, then it annoyed me, and it still annoys me a little. Um, I don't know what kind of stereotype Germans have about Ukraine and Ukrainians, but I always get those awkward questions. Um, why do you speak English? You're Ukrainian. Um, it's practically in every course, when I start the course, I introduce myself and the students ask me where you're from and I say I'm from Ukraine and they say, wow, you're from Ukraine and you speak English, how comes? But okay. they're German and they, they, they speak English. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, that's a very strange And question. then they say, you, you, you can speak Spanish too. Where did you learn it? Did you learn it in Spain? No. Did you learn it in Ukraine? Yes. But are they surprised that you that you that you speak it or that you're teaching it? Both, oh. both. So they would like uh, they would actually say something like, um, "Are you speaking Spanish? Really, you speak Spanish? Uh, did you study Spanish in Spain? No. Did you study Spanish in Ukraine? Yeah. Do people in Ukraine study Spanish? And where did you study Spanish? In Odessa." In the university. Really? Are there universities with Spanish philology in Ukraine? And it's practically every time in the beginning of the course I get these questions. How comes that you speak English? 
And I don't know what to answer. I mean, it's a European country. It's in the middle of Ukraine. Tatiana, Europe. never, never un underestimate the amount of ignorance about foreign countries <laughs> <Definitely>. anywhere. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, people, some people in Germany don't understand why people in Ukraine um, can speak languages, uh, can learn languages. I can say that Ukrainians are really curious and uh, there are plenty of people who learn foreign languages, not only English and Spanish. There are also uh, Italian learners and uh, people who learn French, German. Um, we have two languages as schools, so some schools have three languages and um, that, this is great. This is great. And Ukrainians themselves, they're bilingual. So from the moment of birth, most Ukrainians can speak two languages, which is cool. I mean, it's the case that um, as teachers, we're always aware that some students are only there because they need it like for practical purposes, mm -hmm. like for their job. Whereas um, I would guess a minority are there just out of interest uh, mm -hmm. for travel or anything, as you said. Yeah, I would say that plenty of people need languages for, for work. Um, they want to study abroad, they want to work abroad, or they simply want to communicate with foreign partners. They study the language. Or um, the, the parents, they understand that English is an international language and they want their kids to learn. Um, or because people simply like languages. I, I studied English and Spanish just because I loved languages. It wasn't a special reason for that. Just, to, just tell me something about that, about um, um, children, kids learning uh, languages, uh, for example, English in the Ukraine. At what age do they start at school? What is the kind of... Starting the, the, the from level. three, two okay. or three years old. There are plenty of uh, private schools that offer English uh, lessons starting from practically zero. Uh, English is very popular uh, for young learners in Ukraine and uh, practically all parents believe that their kids should attend extra lessons. They take uh, private tutors, they go to language schools and um, they have a lot of lessons of English uh, and the second language too. It can be German, it can be Spanish or French and a school as well. Um, of course, it's difficult because uh, Ukrainian is very different from English or, or Spanish. Of course, it's easier for Germans to learn English because uh, it's the same language group. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I believe that the new generation of Ukrainians uh, is doing really good at that. So um, I believe that um, after some years, there will be more and more Ukrainians um, who speak languages and have good level. Um, as far as the teachers are concerned, uh, what are the pay rates like compared to here? And uh, is it, I mean, this is something that uh, we, we touched on with um, Ellie's interview, mm -hmm. the fact that in Germany, most of us are freelancers. This is the pain for me, honestly. Um, when I started working um, here as a freelancer, I didn't know what kind of challenge it would be for me later. Uh, and it's really a challenge. Um, it's better and easier to be an employed um, teacher than to be a Freiberufliche freelancer. But unfortunately, if you want to teach adults, um, in most cases, the only offer you get is to work um, as freelancer. Um, it's complicated. And uh, for me, it's lack of stability. Um, when I worked in Ukraine, uh, sometimes I was also a freelancer, but it was easier, much easier. Maybe because um, it, it was a different system, not so many holidays as here. Maybe because... Um, there are more people in Ukraine who want to study languages than here. And when I worked in an online company, when I worked in, uh, in the university, I was always employed worker and um, it was okay because every month I would be sure how much money I get and so on. Here it, it's really complicated. Um, I love Volkshochschule and I love uh, the atmosphere there. The colleagues are great. And as I said before, um, it's, it helped me survive when I came here. Um, I was really depressed and teaching makes me feel better. I forget about problems when I teach. I forget about um, the situation in Ukraine when I teach. And I really enjoy something else. Um, I'm trying to, um, I always try to change the image of Ukraine that uh, foreigners have. Uh, some of them have this old image of Ukraine. Some of them even say that Ukraine has been part of Russia. I heard that myself. And um, 
it's really strange because it was strange for me. Now I realize that it's old stereotype and it has to be changed. That's why I'm always glad when my students ask me about Ukraine and share my experience to tell them about Odessa um, and I do it gladly and I, I, I hope that I manage to change the image of some Germans about Ukraine and Ukrainians. So touching on that, um, both in terms of, um, um, I think, everybody in Europe since uh, since the war started, uh, we, we've been learning about uh, um, Russian and Ukrainian history. Mm -hmm. um, but related to that, how are you finding the, um, the attitude of, of Germans? Um, do, do, you, do you find this a welcoming, friendly sort of place? What, what Absolutely. Your, yeah, okay. Absolutely. Welcoming and friendly. Uh, when I came here first, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I was astonished by the attitude of Germans, and not only Germans. Uh, all people here, um, it doesn't matter where they're from. They, they can be from Turkey, they can be from Syria. They're all very nice and they're all welcoming. Of course, there are good and, ba good and bad people everywhere. Um, I can't say that 100 of people, um, percent of people support Ukraine and um, have pro-Ukrainian position in, uh, concerning the war. But um, luckily, the people I met here, my students, um, they all support Ukraine and they all helped me and uh, express their support. So it was really good. Just going back to something we touched on before, but I'd like you to go into a bit more detail. You talked about differences in methodologies between yeah. the teaching in Ukraine and here. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, nowadays, the communicative approach and lexical approach are getting more and more popular in Ukraine as well. But um, there are still many schools that practice this old translation method. And when I worked in the university, uh, most of the books we had, um, especially for the beginners, were based on this translation method. I don't say it's bad, especially if you teach the future philologists. You have to go in details and for that you need to explain some things. Sorry, take a just to the clarify level. there, when you say the translation method, do you mean that they're seeing their, their mother tongue on yes. one side and English or whatever on the other? And they have to translate. Translating? They have to translate um, directly, they have to translate in written form, oral form. And uh, the grammar is often explained in Ukrainian because um, we, we have complete beginners. Uh, it's a zero level. If we teach people who want to travel, of course, we try to immerse them in the language and we never use language, uh, the, the first language. Uh, we try to use only the language that they learn. But if it's about the future philologists, um, some things have to be explained from the very beginning. When they study phonetics in the beginning, uh, you have to explain and you can't use the target language because um, the level is A1, but they still have to learn this theory of phonetics and uh, some grammatical, um, some details and so on. So as, as far as teaching here in Germany is concerned, um, I, I'm sure we, we know, particularly with lower levels, they do expect the teacher to know some of the language mm -hmm. because they want the teacher to translate stuff for them. Um, Not necessarily. I remember my emotions before my first lesson here in Germany. I was really stressed. It was my first Spanish lesson. It was um, the beginning of May 2022. And my German at that time was a 1.1. So you can imagine how, how nervous I was. Uh, because what if they ask me something in, in, in German? Um, what, what would I do? <laughs> how would I answer? But it, it, it was fine. And I tried to use um, only the target language at the lesson. Now, of course, um, my German is B2 now. And I now, of course, I can answer some questions in German. But um, I try not to do that. I try to um, teach only in English from mm -hmm. the first lesson and not to use German. So even in very, I mean, do you have kind of beginners? Or, yes, or of course. I, I always have the courses of beginners and in Spanish and in English. It all goes well. Sometimes, as I, and as I said before, I use some German words to exp explain, but it's rather an exception than a rule. Mm -hmm. I, I don't use German. I don't have to. Yeah. There is a methodology to teach foreigners mm -hmm. without using their mother language. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I can do that. So thinking of the future, um, um, Tatiana, how, how do you see yourself, um, you know, where do you see yourself in, in three, four, five years from now? 
It's a very complicated question. I don't know how to answer this question, unfortunately. Um, when, we, when we came here, as I mentioned previously, I thought that we would stay here for just one, one month, one, two months. Then I thought, okay, one year. Now it's the second year. After one week, it will be uh, two years of the war. And unfortunately, um, of course, we all believe and hope that the war will finish soon. But um, unfortunately, it's something nobody can predict. And um, I want to return home. I want to live in Odessa. I love Ukraine. Maybe not to Odessa, maybe to Kiev or to Kharkiv. Um, I have been to many cities and every city has um, their own advantages, uh, its own advantages. And every city is beautiful. But uh, the problem is um, I don't know when the war is over and I don't know when I can go home. I want to go home to a safe country. It's a basic need of everyone to be safe. It's a basic need of everyone to know that uh, your kids are safe. We don't have children for now, but we're planning to have. And of course, uh, I would love my kids to live in a safe country. Um, that's why now we're here in Germany. Germany is safe and Germany is welcoming. Um, Germany is friendly for the refugees um, and it has helped us a lot. Um, but um, I'm aware it's not my home and I don't feel here home completely. Of course, um, when I meet people uh, and people are so friendly to me, uh, I feel good, but I can't say that I am at home. It's a great place, but I'm not at home. Yeah. So of course I want to go back, but the question when, unfortunately I can't answer it. When the war is over yeah. and when Ukraine is a safe place again, of course, how I'm does it make you back. feel, Tatiana, when you hear these um, these voices from the you know, the right of the political spectrum in particular, which are kind of putting uh, questioning the, the 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 amounts of money spent on 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 arming and, and aiding Ukraine? This makes me feel very bad because Ukraine does need help. Uh, Ukraine is fighting um, a country which is very big and rich, and which has a lot of resources, human and um, resources to buy weapons um, and um, I believe that Ukraine does need help and um, the foreign countries um, of course there is no obligation but um, they, they are aware that Ukraine needs help I don't know what to say about that one. Sorry. Sorry. I don't know what to say I mean I would love to add that um, <laughs> You don't have to talk about this if you don't yeah. want to. Talk to I mean, the, yeah, Ukraine needs help, absolutely. But um, mm -hmm. nowadays there are plenty of debates that they say that Ukrainians in Germany, um, they don't work, they just use those uh, payments um, and, and they are happy. But Immigrants are always, refugees are always targeted yeah. in that way by certain elements, always. I can speak about me and Ellie. I can't speak about everyone. I can speak about me and Ellie and people I see around um we are working uh since we have been working since uh, may 2022 and early since april 2022 it hasn't always been smooth uh we had ups and downs and as all people and sometimes it was easier sometimes it was more difficult um especially because it's freelance and sometimes uh, you don't work the whole month you work just half a month for example because of the holidays but um i love working and um, I, 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 I'm glad that I can contribute uh, to the economy of the country that welcomed me. Yeah. So this is important for me. I'm a refugee, but I'm aware that I contribute to the economy of the country that welcomed. Yeah. So thank you. Good. So one final question, Tatiana. Um, if you had one piece of advice for any teacher out there, what would it be? You mean Ukrainian teachers in Germany or teachers in general? How about both? Both. All right. Um, so my piece of advice to Ukrainian teachers here in Germany is um, not to give up if it's difficult. And if you don't speak German, there are still ways to teach languages without using the L1 of the students. Um, some teachers don't have or don't know this methodology, haven't learned, uh, but there are plenty of workshops and webinars. Um, you can also get help um, 
subscribing uh, to Melta channel or being member of Melta because Melta helps a lot uh, with information and webinars, seminars um, and many um, other things, um, different events, organizing different events. It's always nice to communicate with our colleagues from abroad. Um, this is the piece of advice I'd give to Ukrainian teachers in Germany. And teachers um, in, in general? In general. Language teachers. So my piece of advice to the teachers uh, in general um, is to join teachers community if you still haven't and share your ideas with your colleagues, um, continue growing, attend um, different events, attend workshops. This really helps even if you already knew that but you forgot or you haven't used that for some time, uh, it helps you get fresh ideas. Tatiana, that was that was great. Thank you very much for joining us on the on the podcast today. Thank you, Mike. Uh, viewers and listeners, um, thank you for listening, for, for watching, and look out for another Melter podcast in the near future. Take care. Bye bye.